two of cross-training. We started cross-training last week. And uh, the focus of this message was on a verse found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. So I'm praying right now today, this message, I really believe this, this message can just be another message. It can just be another Sunday. You listen to another sermon and chalk it up to, I fulfilled my obligation. I went to church. But I don't want it to be that. I want this to be a message that actually, if you will apply this message, I promise you, it will change your heart and your life. Okay? This message comes forth not just so that you can have something to listen to. It comes forth so that we can be transformed. And you know what? That's what the Christian life is about. It's a constant transformation. If you're just the same as you were 10 years ago, you did something wrong in this thing because it's supposed to be continual transformation. We are supposed to be coming more and more Christ-like. So last week we started this uh, particular series and it's called Cross Training and we started and we focused on Matthew 16, 24, which I'll read right now. It says, Then said Jesus to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, um, here's a question. Do we do this nowadays? Do we propose this verse to the newcomer? Do we say, and I, we don't often, we say, uh, you know, we say, do you want to be saved? Do you want to avoid hell? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want God to bless your life? And we offer them those things. But we don't so say, and by the way, you're going to need to face this fact. You're going to need to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. Okay, I don't just want to be a fan of Jesus. I want to be a disciple. And you should want to be a disciple as well. That's what we're here for. So God has called us to be a disciple, and he's called us to follow him. And, you know, when you call Jesus our leader, if you said, who is the leader of the Christian church, you'd have to say Jesus Christ, right? But if you're not following the leader, who's really the leader? For many people, the leader is their own flesh. That's the leader. They are led by the flesh, okay? So we discussed what it meant last week by taking up the cross. And this came on the heels of a series of incidents that occurred a little earlier in the same chapter. Jesus had asked his disciples a question. He said, who do men say that I am? And, uh, you know, they came up with different answers. They said, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this or that. He says, okay, that's great. But who do you guys, the guys who know me, the guys who walk with me, who do you say that I am? And I don't know if there was silence, but all I know is one guy did speak up, and that's Peter. And that's the only one we have recorded. And Peter says this. Peter said, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And when he said that, Jesus let him know, you gave the right answer. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. The heavenly Father has revealed this to you. You didn't get this from flesh and blood, okay? This didn't come from human understanding. This came from the Spirit of God himself. He says, you're so blessed, Simon Peter. Why? Because you got this revelation. Because this revelation changes everything. It changes everything. Blessed are you. Uh, Peter was undoubtedly thrilled at this commendation. But moments later, it all changed for Peter. Jesus had announced after he said this to Peter, he had announced that, by the way, I want to let you guys in on the truth. The truth is this. The Son of Man, me, he says, I'm going to be put to death. And I'm going to rise again the third day. And Peter's like, wait, hold on, hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold on a minute. You're our leader. We are not going to let you be put to death. We'll fight to the death. We will not let you be put to death. So Peter does not like this idea. Something in Peter hadn't gotten that particular part of the revelation. And something in Peter says, no, we cannot allow this. So what Peter did is he said, Jesus, I need to take you aside and talk to you. We need to have a talk. And it says that Peter rebuked Jesus. Now, this is probably the only place in the Bible where I see somebody rebuking Jesus in this matter. And he's like, listen, Jesus, you you got some things right, but this one you got wrong. Okay, it's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way. Now, Jesus' response to him, the response to the man who had been so blessed for having this, this revelation of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus turned to this man when this man said, no, Jesus, we can't let this happen. No, Jesus, don't let this happen. He turned to him in Matthew 16, 23 and said, He turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. 
You're a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Now, a moment earlier, he was saying, you are seeing things from not a human point of view, but from the spirit of Father, the Father. But he says, but now you've just flip-flopped. Now, do you ever realize that there are moments in a day, it could be a split second where you flip-flop from being in the spirit to being in the flesh? Your reaction is perhaps starts out in the spirit and it ends up in the flesh? Do you know how easy it is for that to happen? Do you know we talk about the dead man, the old man. The old man was crucified on the cross with Christ. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, right? But Christ lives in me. So the dead man was crucified. So glad he's dead. Now he's out of the picture. No, he's dead, but he's not out of the picture. (laughs) See, uh, death uh, in its truest sense simply means separation. That old man, that old self is separate from God. It's not... It's not on the same program as God. But guess what? It doesn't go away. It tries to take control again and again through our flesh. Through our flesh. The enemy comes to tempt our flesh to try to take control again and again and again. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't understand something. If you really want to be my follower, you're going to have to deny yourself, your flesh. Your flesh has a will. You see, your flesh has a will. And this is the one thing that God does not control in your life, your will. All right? Um, when Adam and Eve were created, they were given authority over all this stuff, over all this uh, creation that was there. They were uh, given a perfect life, it really was. They didn't have to toil and sweat to produce the fruit of the ground. They had it easy. They had excellent communion with God, a direct connection with God all the time. But they also had a will. In that will, they were allowed to exercise for their gain or for their loss. And God says, I will not prevent you from making your choice. And guess what? Though we belong to Jesus Christ, we belong to him. Though we are members of his family, we're members of the family of God. Though we belong to God, he says, however, your choice, that belongs to you. And you're the one that has to make a choice daily to say, will I deny myself and follow Jesus or will I do my own thing? Every day you're going to come to a crossroads. And the crossroads is an intersection where you decide which way you'll turn. Is at this crossroads, am I going to put myself, my will, on the cross and let it be put to death in favor of God's will? Or am I going to choose my own way? That's the cross we have to bear is Denying the self, denying the desires of the flesh. Jesus said, uh, you know, I'm not calling you guys to be fans. I'm calling you guys to be disciples. And being a disciple means you're going to have to make a choice. And the choice is going to be, are you going to do it God's way or your own way? And if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to choose to do it God's way. You're going to have to choose to deny yourself, put it on the cross, crucify the self. And pick up that cross and follow me wherever I go. You know, Jesus said to these guys, you're going to need to follow me. But he didn't say where he was going. You know, sometimes we say to God, I'll tell you what, God, I'll I'll make a deal. I'll follow you if you show me where you're going first. If you lay the roadmap ahead of me and show me where we're going, then I'm going to decide if I like following you or not. And God's saying, I want you to trust me and I want you to follow me no matter where I go. Even if I lead you through the valley of the shadow of death, follow me. Oh, that takes some strength, doesn't it? This is where the cross comes in. This is the point where we put our will on the altar of sacrifice to be put to death. This is where we surrender ourselves to doing the will of God. It's an everyday occurrence. Now, in the Old Testament, sacrifices were offered up every day. Sacrifices were offered every day. Now, there was one peculiar, peculiar sacrifice that was only offered once a year on the Day of Atonement. Okay? On the Day of Atonement, there was a special sacrifice. It was offered by the high priest. Here's what happened. is on the Day of Atonement, uh, the sacrificial offering could have been a lamb or a goat, but the sacrificial offering was chosen. It had to be blemish-free. It had to be perfect visually. Okay? It had to be a choice specimen, and it was going to die. In that particular case, it had no will whether it died or not. It was chosen to die. Okay? So it was put to death. And after it was put to death, some of its blood was taken. And the blood was taken by the high priest behind the veil. And it was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And it atoned for the sins of all the people for a time. 
for a period of time. Only the high priest could enter in. He could only enter in once a year to do that particular sacrifice. But every other day of the year, every other priest was offering sacrifices. There were sacrifices daily. Every priest has to offer sacrifices, okay? Now, the sacrifice that the high priest did, that was a symbol, and it was a type of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ would do himself. He would become the sacrificial lamb himself. He would be the high priest himself. He himself would go into the temple not made with hands, into the holy place. He himself would offer his own blood, sprinkling it upon the mercy seat to cleanse the people. And this didn't happen one year. It happened once in a lifetime forever. Forever that sacrifice, forever that sprinkling of that blood cleansed all who were believe and come thereafter. Everyone. He had to do that once. The high priest had to do it once a year. He had to do it once for eternity. But every other priest still has sacrifices. You know, after that was done on the Day of Atonement, the other priests, the next day, you know, if it was a Sunday or Monday, the next day, they got to go back to work. They've got other sacrifices. There was continual sacrifice. Now, do you realize that we're, we're uh, priests? We have been made kings and priests unto God. Do you realize that you right now are a king and a priest unto God? Here's what it says in Revelations 5, 9 through 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us... Has, that's a past tense, has already, made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, we are all priests, but Jesus was the high priest. Hebrews 4.14 spells that out. It says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. The high priest sacrificed the final offering himself to atone for the sins in accordance with the way it was done on the Day of Atonement spelled out in Leviticus chapter 16. The other priest still had a job. The other priest still had daily sacrifices. Jesus, the high priest, did his job, but now it's time for us to do our job. Jesus did this. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12 says this. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, he entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, That is not of this creation. He did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Jesus was the high priest. He died on that cross on the day of atonement. Jesus offered his own spotless blood as a sin sacrifice that would atone for all people's sins for all time that would believe on him. Jesus had to deny the desires of his flesh to do that. His flesh did not want to be on a cross. Your flesh wouldn't want to be on a cross. Your flesh still doesn't want to be on the cross he's talking about. Your flesh still says, but I don't like that. It's uncomfortable. Your flesh says, but I want my way. Your flesh is like, you know, sometimes you can just look at the old man. Sometimes you can just look at the flesh as, a, as a, just a bratty little child. I want my way. I want it my way, and I want more. And I just want candy for dinner every night. It just wants what it wants, even if it's not good for it. But if we're led by the Spirit, it means we have to have control over that thing. It means that we're going to have to deny that thing. It means that we're going to have to put that thing to death sometimes on a cross. Because it says, no, 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 don't make me do that. And we're going to say, you know what? To fulfill the will of God, you're going to do it. Okay? Jesus had to deny the desires of his flesh so that he could follow the desires of his Spirit, of God's Spirit. Or he would never have allowed himself to be nailed to that cross if he had been led by the flesh. So Jesus chose to take up his own cross. He chose to put his will to death on that cross. You would have thought that Peter would have gotten the point after Jesus rebuked him. Jesus, he he takes Jesus aside and says, Jesus, you can't do this. You can't let him kill you. And and Jesus says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. What What you're saying now is the flesh. That's the flesh talking, and I don't want to hear it. Now just get away from me. Just get away from me. Oh, that had to hurt Peter's feelings. You know what? Jesus is still here. I really would, you know, it's really possible for sensitive to the Spirit. There are probably some days Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. We make choices. It's like Jesus going, hey, listen, you're in the flesh right now. Wake up. You're in the flesh. Come on, man, you're offending me right now. If we'd listen. 
You see, there are things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? You can grieve the Holy Spirit. And you know the way we grieve the Holy Spirit? There's two really common ways. Number one is in choosing the will of the flesh over the will of the Father. And number two is in attitude. Attitude. Those are two things we have to submit to God. And when those things aren't submitted to God, we're not where we should be with God. Okay? Now, when it came time for Jesus to be arrested, we would have thought Peter got the lesson. I mean, after Jesus hits you in the face with, bam, you're, you're like Satan to me right now, you're going to go, oh, I'm not going there anymore. I don't want to be likened to Satan. So you think Peter would back off, and he's not going to try to persuade Jesus not to die on the cross. He's not going to per- try to persuade Jesus to stay away from death. But Peter really didn't get it anyway. He still was trying to prevent it. And here's what he did. When they came, as was accordance to the prophecies in the scriptures, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulled out a sword. No. Okay, yeah, I heard what you said, but I'm not letting him take you. I'm, I, we're going down, all of us, but I'm not letting him take you. He pulled out his sword. And Jesus had to say, listen, dude, you're in the flesh again. You're in the flesh. Now, here's what Jesus said to Peter when he pulled out his sword. Matthew 26, 52 through 54. Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Are you not aware? He's saying, Peter, are you not aware that I can call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? I don't need your help. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say this must, it must happen this way? He's saying, I've come to fulfill the scriptures. And guess what? I'm going to have to die. No, I can't let you die. Guess what? You're not going to stop me. I could have called 12,000 or 12 legions of angels if I had chosen. I didn't choose because I'm going to put my will on the cross. I'm going to deny self and go on the cross. Why? Because of the will of the Father. Why? Because to fulfill the scriptures so that all of you can partake in God's divine nature, so that all of you can be called the sons of God, so that all of you can be forever forgiven for your sins, so that all of you can become a dwelling place of the Most High. He says, I've got to do it. I despise the shame of it, but I see the hope that lays beyond it, and it's worth it. I must do it. Peter's like, no, no, I can't let you. It's like, Peter, step aside. Step aside, Peter. You know what? We've got to tell the flesh to step aside sometimes, because the flesh is going to prevent us from putting our will on the cross. And the devil will try to partner with your flesh. And the devil will say, you know, let me give you some good reasonings why maybe you don't need to in this situation. Let me kind of discuss this with you. Let's be reasonable. It's not about reasonable. Reasonable means that you understand the whole situation. It's about trust. And trust says, whether I understand it or not, I will do the will of my Father. That's when we put our death on the cross. Jesus is our high priest. He also was the sacrificial lamb. You know, he was the only sacrificial lamb who, who had a choice. You realize that? All the other lambs, they didn't choose. They didn't know, and their little lamb and brain, they weren't going, hey, they're taking me somewhere. Oh, look, this is a nice little tent they got going on here. Didn't know what was going to happen, but Jesus knew what was going to happen. And Jesus chose to go anyway, because he said, you're worth it. Wow, can you imagine that? Aren't you glad that God didn't design it in a different way, saying, I have a plan of salvation for you all. You will all have to be crucified on a cross, and then you'll be forgiven. Aren't you glad we didn't have to go that route? Because he loves you. He says, I'm going to allow you to receive what Christ did on the cross by faith. What do we owe God for that? Everything. 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 Jesus was the high priest. He offered himself. He sprinkled his own blood. And Jesus is the high priest. Every high priest has to offer something. Every high priest had an offering to do. And here's what it says in Hebrews 8, 3. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our priest must make an offering too. And he did. It was his own blood. We are priests as well. We're just not the high priest. And every priest has to have an offering to offer. Do you realize that? Our offering, which is to be offered up daily. You see, the Day of Atonement came once a year, but there were every other day of the year. And that's where every other sacrifice was offered, the other days of the year. We are to be offering up, as priests, sacrifices daily. 
We are not offering a certain sacrifice, however. We're not offering up sacrifices of blood any longer because the final blood sacrifice was finished in Christ Jesus. When he offered up his own blood, that was the atoning blood that took care of it forever. All the blood that came before Jesus was just simply a a deferment of punishment. It was to say, okay, you got a little more time before judgment comes. Uh, We'll put that off a little bit. You won't get judged today because the blood's there. We'll judge you tomorrow. Oh, the blood's there. We'll judge you the next day. But now Jesus has once for all finished it. He satisfied the debt. We have received eternal redemption. We are forgiven, but we're made priests and kings unto God. And we're members of his royal family and his household. And we as royal priests, we're a royal priesthood. We as royal priests, we have an offering to be offering. We don't get to just rest, we have to offer. Now, I want to talk about two kinds of offerings in particular that we are to be offering. Number one, we've already talked about. Number one is your will. See, God doesn't take your will. It's a sacrifice. God doesn't say, I'll tell you what, just once in your life, just say, Lord, I give you my will, and then I'll just take control of it for the rest of your life. I'll I'll stare. Every day we have the choice of giving God our will or not. Every day we have a crossroads that we're going to come up to probably several times a day where we're going to have to choose to put our will, denying self, on the cross or to say we're not going there. I'm not going to follow Jesus today. I'm going to follow my own way. The first thing that we can sacrifice to God is our will. The will is the only thing we ever really owned at all anyway. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. Your car is his. Your house is his. Your body is his. Everything on this earth is his. But the one thing he gave to you was your will. And it's the one thing you can sacrifice and say, for you, I'm going to deny myself and Do your will. The number two thing we can offer up as a sacrifice, we can offer up praise and thanksgiving. Here's what it says in Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, an offering is often called a sacrifice as well. Sacrifice and offering, an offering a sacrifice. Some days it's a sacrifice to offer up praise. Some days your flesh says, I don't feel so full of praise. Some day your heart says, I don't have a merry heart today. Offering up praise feels fake to me. That's what it feels like. On those days, we have to make a choice. We have to deny self. Self says, but I don't want to praise. And we say, self, you're going to praise because you were made to praise God. Because the spirit in you gives you the power to praise God. Now, I'm quite sure I'm quite sure, picture this, picture, picture Paul and Silas being arrested. And Paul and Silas were beaten. They were beaten. I'm sure they weren't just spanked. They were beaten. They were bleeding. They were chained to a prison wall. And they could have been chained to a prison wall. You can see them just hanging there off the prison wall, chains. And uh, Paul says to Silas, why don't we sing a few songs? Are you, like, are you out of your mind? How about in a few days after I heal up? Maybe now is not a good time. Because I'm bleeding and I'm in great pain. Let's sing some worship. Worship! What, how, let's start asking God why he let this happen to us. Worship, are you crazy? Well, to your flesh, it's crazy. But to their spirit, it wasn't crazy because they were made for worship. In their heart was the spirit of God. In their heart, the praises were in them. And the praises want to come out. And the praises are in you too. And sometimes you've got to get out of the way so the praises can come out. So they decided against all reasoning, this is a good time to praise God. And they began to praise God. They began to sing praises to God. And you know what happened? The whole prison was shaken and the walls of it were shaken. Their praise changed their circumstance. Their, cha- their praise changed their surroundings. All the doors of the prisons popped open. And not only that, fine, they popped open, but we're still chained to a wall. It says, and all the chains came loose. Everything that bound them came loose. Everything around them that had them trapped, had them where they could do nothing, God loosed them and let them free. How did they get there? How did they get to that place of God coming through for them, of God bringing them a great deliverance? Because they made a choice against the flesh. The flesh says, I don't feel like praising this, and we're going to praise God. We're going to praise him anyway. Giving thanks 
in all things. Now, here's what it says. Look at, look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. All right. So, can you imagine if you took the Bible, the New Testament, let's take that because we're New Testament people. We're in a new covenant. So, imagine if you took the Bible and everywhere where you're instructed to do something, you didn't look at it as good advice. You looked at it as a command. All right? So, everywhere it said, do this and do that, it wasn't like, here's some good advice. Why don't you think about doing this? But it says, actually, I want you to do it. So, you look at this verse here, and it says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19, it says, rejoice always. Suppose that wasn't a suggestion. Suppose that was actually a command. Suppose you're a disciple. Well, what's a disciple? It's one that denies self. It's one that denies self, picks up a cross. It's one that follows Jesus. Well, if we're really following Jesus, do we do what he says? I think we have to do what he says if we follow him. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to rejoice always. Oh, but Lord, you don't understand. Are you kidding me? The Lord understands everything. You're asking me to do something impossible. He says, no, no, I'm asking you to do something that's possible because of the Holy Spirit in you. It's possible. You're asking me to do something that's hard. Yes, absolutely. It's hard for your flesh. It's not hard for your spirit. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. He says, when I ask you, when I tell you to rejoice always, he says, that's an opportunity to make a choice to deny yourself and do it or not. Follow the flesh. Then he goes on to say, they go on to, and the scripture goes on to say, pray continually. Lord, I don't always feel like praying. You know what? There's a lot of things your flesh doesn't feel like doing. And usually the stuff it feels like doing will get you in trouble. So your flesh doesn't want to come to church. It doesn't want to raise its hands. It doesn't want to praise God. It doesn't want to worship. It doesn't want to do any of that stuff. Guess what? That'll get you. He says that if we're by the, led by the flesh, we are led to death. If we're led by the Spirit, we're led to life. Every day we have a choice to say, who's going to lead me today, the flesh or Christ? He says, rejoice always, pray continually. Now here's what it says. This is a, this is a good one. Give thanks in all circumstances. But Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. Imagine your baby's in the hospital right now. And, and, and they don't know what to do. And this, you're, you're thinking, my baby could die if there's not a miracle. And, and you read this scripture, it says, um, give thanks in all things. You go, oh, wait a minute, can't mean this. It doesn't say give thanks for all things. It says give thanks in all things. Why? Because, you know, a lot of us think that everything God asks us is because he wants to flex his power and show us that we're admitting he's boss. Okay, we'll do it to prove your boss. And that isn't why he tells us to do things. He tells us to do things because it's for us. He tells us to do things because it's for our good. He says, listen, guys, look at Paul and Silas. You're in the midst of a situation you don't like. You're in the midst of a situation that's uncomfortable. He says the way out of the situation is to begin to say, thank you, Lord, in the midst of the situation. I'm not thankful, Lord, that this sickness is on my child. No, definitely not thankful. But I'm thankful, Lord, that you are in this picture here. You are in my situation. You are in my life right now, and I trust in you. I thank you that I can trust in you because you can't trust in a doctor because doctors can have good intentions, but they don't have the power of God, Amen. right? Yeah. Doctors can try their best, and they can fail, right? So it says, give thanks in all circumstances. Well, why should I do that? Well, because it's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Well, but I want to do my own thing. Then you don't want to be a disciple. But I don't feel like it. Well, then you haven't put yourself on the cross. You haven't taken up your cross. You haven't denied self. But denying self is hard. Yeah, nobody said it was, it was easy. But denying self is the very thing that brings you into God's perfect will. And in God's perfect will, there's blessing. Blessing beyond anything you can generate on your own. Trust me. Okay? Now, this is something I want you to know, too, is we read these verses, and sometimes we group together verses in groups, and we say, here's a paragraph. And what that means when you've got a paragraph is the next sentence is a new subject or something. But they're not always new subjects. Sometimes they go together. And we've divided it up. You know, the way the Scripture was originally written, it didn't have all these periods and commas. and all. It didn't have all that. It was all one big piece. It was continuous. So let me show you something. There's another verse that we don't include in this grouping of verses when we read them. We usually say this. We say, here's the verses, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will for you, of God concerning you in Christ Jesus, period. Next thought. Don't quench the spirit. 
I want you to know that these verses go together. When you don't rejoice, you're quenching the Spirit because the Spirit in you wants to cry out, Abba, Father. When you aren't praying, you're quenching the Spirit. When you're not giving thanks, you're quenching the Spirit. You see, the Spirit within you wants to leap out of you and say, I praise God, I worship God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Your spirit in you wants to praise God, but your flesh says, but I don't feel like it. And when we say flesh, you can have your way, we've just quenched the spirit. We've quenched the spirit, and that's exactly what the enemy wants. Right now, you may feel it in your life. You may say, I've got something going on in my life that's distracting me right now. i got something pretty heavy in my life right now. i got something I don't like in my life right now. I got people I don't like. I got circumstances I don't like. I got all this stuff I don't like in my life right now. And God says, guess what? I knew you were going to get into all that stuff, but can you do what I told you to do? Can you rejoice? Can you say thanks? Right? Can you pray? Well, no, I can't, Lord, because I'm, I'm upset. He goes, well, this has nothing to do with being upset. I gave you my Holy Spirit so that even when you're upset, you've got the power to do this. And the Holy Spirit in you wants to do this. Yeah, Lord, but I don't feel like it. Yeah, but that's your flesh, and we don't go by the flesh, do we? Because your spirit wants to worship me. Your spirit wants to connect with me. Your spirit wants to do the will of God. Not giving thanks is not being led by the spirit, but by the will of the flesh. The spirit is filled with praise. Now, so as priests, it's clear we still have a daily service to perform. We still have a daily offering to make. We have to offer every single day of our lives our will on the cross, in preference for God's will. Oh, but maybe I don't want to be a disciple then. I'll just be a fan. Jesus never called fans. He only called disciples. He said, take up that cross and follow me. He said, you know what? Can I do it without the cross? Because that's kind of, you know, it's kind of a weight I don't want to deal with. He says, look, don't question it. This is the way it is. Everybody who will follow me is going to have to take up their own cross. And they're going to have to deny their own self. Oh, but God, that's hard. Yeah, but it gets easier the more you do it. That's why it's called discipleship. See, disciple means, comes from the root word that has to, has to do with discipline. When you discipline yourself to do something, after a while it becomes a habit. And after it becomes a habit for long enough, it becomes second nature. And then you don't even have to think about it. If you made it a habit, if you made it a discipline in all things to be rejoicing in God, in all things to be giving thanks, in all things to be praying continually, to be giving thanks in everything, guess what? After a while, it becomes your nature. And that nature is not just something you're doing just because it's a good thing to do. It's something you're doing because it's what the Spirit in you wants to do, and it brings you into line, alignment with God. And it brings your circumstances in life into alignment with God's will for you. When you're doing your own thing, you get in trouble. When you're doing it God's way, you get the blessing. Do you want the blessing? See, there's even a, there can even be a selfish motive in this, but it's okay is to say, I want God's best blessing. Okay, then do what he says. Amen. Give thanks. Rejoice. Pray continually. Don't quench the spirit. Now, it's clear as priests, we still have a daily sacrifice, and it involves putting something to death, the will of our flesh. And offering up something, the offering of thanksgiving and praise. Just before the veil of the tabernacle, the veil that covered up the holiest place, where behind that holiest, that, behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant, and upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid was the mercy seat. And that mercy seat is the very place where the high priest would enter in once a year, sprinkle his blood to atone for the sins. Jesus entered into the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. Jesus tore the curtain in two so we could enter in any time we want. Jesus sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat once and for all, not every year, once and for all, for all time. But before you got into that place where that ark was behind that veil, there was something in front of the veil. It was called the golden altar of incense. And before the priest went in there, the priest would do something. He'd offer something, a handful of incense onto the coals of fire. And the incense would fill that whole place with a smoke that said it had a sweet-smelling savor. Do you know, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that the prayers of the saints are the incense that ascend up into God's throne, and they are sweet-smelling savor to him. Do you realize your prayers are a sweet-smelling savor to him? Now, when we're praising God, when we're worshiping God, when we're giving God glory... 
We're creating a sweet atmosphere that God loves, that God loves, and God dwells in that atmosphere, and God's presence manifests in that atmosphere. It's the glory cloud. And you know what? We're not often there because we're in the flesh 99% of the time, aren't we? But you don't have to be. The glory cloud's awaiting all of us. We need to start offering up the sweet-smelling savor of praises. But I don't feel thankful right now. Yeah, do it because of that. Because you're going to get thankful once you start doing it. Because you're going to see God move. And you're going to be thankful for what he's done. Begin to offer. You say, but I don't feel like it. Put the, put the flesh on, on the cross. And here's what happens. When you do that, when you begin to say, Lord, I'm going to praise you anyway. I'm going to praise you in the midst of it. I'm going to praise you when I'm in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to praise you. The rocks will cry out if I don't do it. I'm going to praise you because the Holy Spirit in me wants to flow and praise you. I'm going to let the praises come out. But I don't like this. I don't like, I don't like my job. I don't like my church. I don't like my marriage. You know, all that stuff you don't like. Begin to praise him. God can change the atmosphere. And so we're giving forth this sweet-smelling savor to God. Now, I want to tell you something. Picture that. Picture that your prayers are ascending and filling the heavens with this cloud of glory and sweet-smelling savor. And God is saying, I'm so pleased with you. Now, wake up. Wake up from the dream because I want to give you something else. If your praise is a sweet-smelling savor, what do you think your complaints smell like? What do you think your complaints smell like to God? Oh, they stink. You know, we weren't designed to complain and to gripe. We were designed to praise. We were made to praise. Griping and complaining don't smell so good. Out of the innermost being, out of the innermost part of your being, there's supposed to be a fountain of living water. It's supposed to be a fountain. Now, it's not a well. It's a fountain. There's a big difference. You see, the difference is this. In a well, it can stay there. But in a fountain, it's pushed out. There's a natural force that pushes it out. Do you realize the Holy Spirit in you wants to push out? And we block that off sometimes with our flesh. But the Holy Spirit wants to push out from us praises to God. Um, John 4, 14 says this. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. John 7, 38 says this. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow river, rivers of living water. Do you know the rivers and the fountain are meant to come out of you? Not to stay in you. We're fine. God, I got, I got my thermos filled. I'm Okay. God says, no, no, I want you to be a fountain, not a thermos, okay? I don't want you to be a jug of water. I want you to be a fountain of water that springs up and comes out. And it comes out so much that as it comes out of you, those praises, guess what? It drowns out the grumbling around you. It changes the atmosphere around you. In fact, this isn't just any kind of water. It's living water. So actually, it's life-giving water. So as you begin to allow the praise to come out to you, that's your sacrifice, because the flesh says, I don't feel like praising. You just say, you're going to be put on the cross right now because I need to praise. And you begin to praise, and it begins to become a river that flows out of you, and that river fill, floods you. And suddenly you're surrounded by this atmosphere of God's presence. And guess what? People are attracted to you because when they come around you, you're talking something that gives life. And if you're griping and complaining, you smell like a garbage can that hasn't been dumped in a long time. And people walk the other side of the street to stay away from you. Because you don't bring life, you bring death. But we shouldn't be that kind of a person. Grumbling and complaining bring death. Praise brings things, brings life. Complaining and grumbling come from the will of the flesh inspired by the devil. Praise and thanksgiving comes from the will of the spirit inspired by God himself. Grumbling and complaining are blockages to our spiritual fountains. They block the flow of life-giving water. And without water, death follows. Okay. Here's what it says, 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 11. Now, you remember the children of Israel in the wilderness, and they were out there, and they started to grumble and complain. You remember that? And they said, you know, think about it. They're out in the middle of a desert, and it's going to be hard tomorrow to say we've got to find water for a couple million people. Oh, it's going to be difficult, maybe impossible. But God says, look, I'm providing you with a rock, and the rock's going to follow you and give you water every day. You don't even have to look for it. It's like, wow, thank you. No, they got tired of that too. 
Uh, they said, how are we going to find enough food to feed all these people, Lord? He says, tell you what, I'm going to provide food for you. Every morning, manna will come down and appear on the ground like frost. You can collect it up as much as you want and eat it. You will have food every day. And this food is so well balanced, right, is that you will have every nutrient in it you possibly could need so you'll be healthy for years and years and years and years and years because they were out there 40 years. It'll be enough. It doesn't lack in vitamin C or D or B complex. None of that. It's got it all. And so they're getting free food. Don't even have to go and hunt for it every day. But they get tired of it. And they go, they go okay, so what's on the menu for breakfast today? They go, oh, manna again? God, can you at least flavor it? You know, how about like fruit flavored manna? And each day I get banana or raspberry or cherry. Something different, but not manna. We just, we're tired of manna. They got tired of God's provision. God's goodness got taken for granted. And they began to complain, saying, we don't want stupid, stinking manna. That was keeping them alive. We don't want that. So it says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 11. We should not test Christ. You know, it's testing God when you complain. Because God's saying, if you understand that I'm for you and the things that I allow are good, and in the end it's going to come out for the best because it's my will, then... Why would you complain? You're, what you're telling me is you don't like the way I do things. That's what you're doing. So here's what it says. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Ah, they were killed by snakes. And do not complain or grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Now these things, okay, so it's a, well, glad that happened in the Old Testament. Glad that all happened in the Old Testament. Glad that didn't happen to us today. It says they grumbled and complained. They were destroyed of the destroying angel. But here's what it says right after that. It says, uh, by the way, these things happened to them as examples that were written down for warnings for us. They're for us. That example was for us to say, oh my God, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the one that's grumbling and complaining. The one that's always saying, God, my life's not good enough. I don't like what you're doing. Okay? Proverbs 13, 2 says this, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. Proverbs 18, 20, and 21 says this, With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Are you sowing seeds with your lips of something you'd like to eat later? If you don't want to eat it later, sow something better. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit. We need to begin to sow praise, thanksgiving, glory to God. Complaining blocks the flow of living water, and when you block the flow of living water, You stagnate. It's a lot of stagnant Christians because they've allowed the flow to be blocked by complaining. Why do they complain? Because they've allowed the will of their flesh to occur because the devil says, you know, you're ticked off. You ought to just start whining about it. You start complaining about it. Start saying, God, why are you doing it this way? You should have done it this way. The devil has inspired that and the flesh has gone along with it. And when you do, you block the well. You block the flow. Now, in Genesis chapter 26, Isaac is described, son of Abraham, as a man who had these huge wealth. He had flocks and herds, and your wealth was often determined by the land you owned and the herds you had. So he had all this land, his father's land, and he had all these herds. He was a very, very rich man. The Philistines are the enemies. And the Philistines saw him, and they were jealous of him. And they go, we don't like the fact he's so prosperous. We don't like the fact he's doing well. Do you know what your enemy doesn't like that about you either? Do you know your enemy is jealous of you? Do you know the devil is jealous of the position you have with God because he can't have it? We're called the sons of God. He can't be that. We've got eternal redemption. He's already lost the battle. He's already doomed to hell. He's jealous of you. And he's like the Philistines. You know what the Philistines did? They go, it's not, I don't like seeing that man of God prospering we got to do something to stop this because this bugs us. So let's go fill his wells full of stones. We'll plug up his wells because if you plug up his wells, he won't have water. If he doesn't have water, he can't, feed, he can't uh, you know, water his, his, his uh, cattle and they'll die. You see, the enemy attacked the source of water, the source of life, and put a stop to it. The enemy plugged up his wells so that his herds could, would die off. And what did Isaac do? Here's what Isaac did. It's the thing that we do first of all. Something happens we don't like. Like say, well, it happens in churches all the time. Something happens in church you don't like and you get a bitter, a bad attitude. You say, tell you what, I'll move to another church. And you go to another church. And then you realize it happens again. You realize everywhere I go, it happens. You're the common denominator, okay? Everywhere I go, it happens. You know what? You're trying to avoid what you need to address. 
So Isaac didn't address it. He didn't unplug those wells. He said, I'll move, I got other wells. I'll move to another place. So he moves to another place. Guess what? They came and plugged those two. He had to finally address it. You're going to have to face the enemy. The enemy's going to tempt you and taunt you to say, come on, you know you got a good gripe and you let it fly. And you're going to say, no, 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 no. I've chosen to follow Christ. What comes forth from these lips is the offerings of sacrifice and praise and thanksgiving. But that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense of flesh. Don't, it doesn't have to. It makes sense because of who I am. That's why it makes sense. It makes sense because I'm a fountain of living water, see? It makes sense because I'm a source of God's praise. It comes out of me. It just comes out as, as natural because it's part of who I am. The enemy wants to stop up your well. When the water doesn't flow, we get spiritually dry. And then the enemy tries to kill us off spiritually. And there's a lot of Christians who are spiritually dried up. You need to get the blockage out of the well. You need to let the flow go. When the flow starts going, you need to be giving thanks. You need to be worshiping God. You need to pray in the spirit. You need to pray in, with understanding. You need to let the abundant life flow from your heart. When it flows from your mouth, it becomes this river of living water. You find once it's unclogged, it flows pretty good. And after it's flown, for, or, or, flown out of you, flown, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. After it's flowed out of you for days, you find that your surroundings have changed. Suddenly, the whole land's been watered. Suddenly, things are springing up from all over that you didn't even expect because you were used as a fountain of God. You were a priest of God offering up sacrifices, sacrifices that were sacrifices because you didn't feel like it. They cost you something. Your flesh says, I'm too tired to do it. But you said, I'm going to do it anyway because it cost me something, but it's worth it. And in that is the blessing. And God tells you to do all the things he tells you to do for your own good because he loves you, because he wants you in, with, in communion with him. All right, we're going to stop right there. Now, um, what I just said was a whole lot of words. And if you speak English, you understood what the words meant. The question is, are you going to let those words come in this ear and out this ear? Or are you going to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to start offering up daily the sacrifices that I as a priest should be offering up. I'm going to start daily when I come to that intersection where I make this decision. Do I follow the flesh or do I follow the spirit? I'm going to make the decision to put the flesh on the cross and follow Jesus. If you do that, your whole life and your surroundings and your world will change because that's God's will for your life. So if you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart, if you have never accepted him as your savior, this is the day to do that. There is no better time than right now. If you have never asked him into your heart, if you've never asked him to forgive you for your sins and to make you a new creation, raise your hand. We want to pray with you right now. Anybody at all? All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, your word is life to us. And if we eat of it, we live. So, Lord, we want to eat of it. And, Lord, uh, we, we're going to offer up praise to you. We're going to thank you today. But, Lord, we also want to say, Lord, forgive us for being grumblers and complainers. We don't want to be that way anymore. We want to be fountains of praise. We want to be wells uh, 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 springing up. We want to be fountains springing up with everlasting life with living water, such that, Lord, we not only uh, uh, ourselves be, be, are able to drink of that water, but people around us can drink of that water because we're a spring. And we feed those around us with your positive word, your joy, your love, your comfort. And so, Lord, right now, let's just get our wells unplugged, Lord. And let us, Lord, just begin now to flow. And let us make the decisions, Lord, that say we're going to choose to do it God's way. We're going to put this flesh on the cross and we're going to fulfill the will that you have for our lives. And our lives are going to be a beautiful thing because you are guiding them. We thank you for what you're about to do. We thank you in the midst of circumstances we may have right now that we don't like. We thank you in the midst of them, not for them, but we thank you for being you and that you are with us in the midst of them and that you're working a miracle right now. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Have a great day.